Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Hi, I'm Bob Dambeck. And I'm Barb Gravel. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the people and places that contribute to the arts, culture, and history in our region. On this edition, we'll meet an area landscape artist, watch the process of creating a film by an award-winning area filmmaker, and tap our toes to some authentic old-time Appalachian music. Kelly Corcoran has conducted major orchestras throughout the United States and is currently in her sixth season with the Nashville Symphony Orchestra. She has extensive experience with educational and community programming and projects to reach new audiences. Recently, Corcoran brought her talents to the FM area as a finalist in the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony Orchestra's Conductor Search. <laughs> As musicians, we really are in public service. That's what we're here to do, you know, and, and I think that that community-minded focus combined with excellent artistry and bringing to a community outstanding musicians and outstanding repertoire is just what I want to do. I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. I started out in a non-musical family. The story goes that my sister kind of was the singer in the family, and um, we were auditioning for a community theater production of Annie when I was in seventh grade, and I got a role. Second clarinet. It was kind of this big deal because I thought, oh my goodness, maybe I have a voice too, maybe I'm a singer too, and it was the first time that I had ever really received any kind of recognition for any kind of musical talent. When I graduated from high school, I knew that I wanted to pursue music. So I went to Boston Conservatory and um, I was accepted into the Tanglewood Festival Chorus and they are the chorus that sings with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I had never heard sounds like that and certainly not on stage, you know, being a part of it. And I also was very, very fascinated with the idea of the conductor, the maestro, and to be able to watch all these different conductors coming on stage and their persona and the way that they would interact with the orchestra and with the chorus and how they got results. It just was very thrilling to me, the idea that when you're a conductor, it's, it's your duty to really understand the history of a piece, the personality of the composer, the personality of your musicians, of your audience. Let's start variation 16 one more time. 16, this yum, bum, 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 bum. Not that short, no, a little bit more length. Yes, yeah, exactly, thank you. I think being a singer, you know, I can sing something the way that I want it to sound. I mean, and I, I do that all the time without even thinking about it. Even in the Tchaikovsky Mozartiana that we're preparing, there was one little variation, and I just said to the first violins, bum bottom, bum bottom, bum bottom, bum bottom. And Ben said, oh, okay, an ex expressive accent, and he gave it to the section, and it was perfect. I'm interested in this orchestra for many reasons. This orchestra has a very long history and tradition of um, successful programming, successful projects, um, you know, just people who really, even from day one, have cared about making music and making music, you know, for, for the soul of enhancing the community and the lives of the people here. When you're working in an orchestra, when you're working with um, chamber music groups, 
it's all about collaboration. It's all about flexibility. You're, you're having to give and take what you're doing. It's all about creativity and also innovation that you're creating new ideas and coming up with new ideas. And so I think that this is a great testament to the importance of music education in our schools and why it's so critical that we have music in our schools. And you guys in this community are doing a great job of that. The string programs in the schools here are outstanding and not every part of the country has a program like that and so that is very 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 special and to me that signifies that the arts are an essential part of the fabric of life here. Good, 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 good. And it's in the longer notes um, where we really need to hear a little bit more vibrato, a little bit more warmth to the sound. When you have the moving stuff, it kind of can happen quickly, but that's where our ear hears it if we're not all doing the same thing. Let's do everybody at letter A. And our accompaniment, nice and soft, not too much, very light, almost just barely touch these quarter notes. One and two. I would hope that I can take my experiences and the things that I've maybe discovered along the way about music and what it has meant to me and the power that it has in our community. And if I can communicate that to a young musician and somehow make a difference and somehow have an opportunity to show someone something that maybe they didn't see before, it's really exciting for me. It's like a table, you know, and you have these chi these uh, legs that are there, and you have, you know, your board, you have your executive director, you have your musicians, you have your conductor, you know, you have all these people, and if any of them is a weak link, that table's gonna wobble, you know? So really, yes, the music director can inspire, has to have the vision, it's really a leader, and yes, is at the helm of the organization, but all the pieces have to be working, you know? They all have to be working and strong. Um, and that's what impresses me about this orchestra, because I think you have that here. The Fargo-Moorhead Symphony is searching for its next music director. This season, our Masterworks concerts will each be led by one of the five finalists. The decision of who will be the next artistic leader will involve valuable input from the orchestra musicians, audience members, symphony supporters, students, and members of the community, including you. The countdown begins. Who will be the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony's next conductor? Award-winning Moorhead filmmaker Tom Brandau has been making independent films for nearly 30 years. The Baltimore native has a unique and soft touch in the way he makes his films, and he's now passing that knowledge on to future filmmakers as a professor of film studies at Minnesota State University, Moorhead. I work on the 19th floor. Ordinary Policy Department, Premium Accounting Division. When I was about 20 years old, I saw the uh, Billy Wilder film, The Apartment, for the first time. And when I was watching it, there was something about it, the dialogue, that just seemed awfully familiar, even though I knew that I'd never seen that film before. I think it was over Thanksgiving dinner. I actually mentioned this to my mother, and my mother just looked at me and laughed and she said, well, when you were born, it was in late August, you were overdue. I would go to the theater every day and watch a film. And it just so happened that they were running the apartment. So I must have seen the apartment something like 10 times while I was waiting for you to actually be born. Who knows, right? The moment for me when I figured out that I wanted to be a filmmaker for a living didn't happen until college, even though the roots went further back. My undergrad was at a small university, Towson State University in Baltimore. From the stripping of the blubber. My thesis project as an undergraduate was a documentary that I made in Iceland about Icelandic whaling. I ultimately sold that to the Discovery Channel, and it was also nominated for a Student Academy Award. So I decided to apply to the AFI, the American Film Institute in Los Angeles, and I applied as a directing fellow. I did not consider myself a director before I went to that institute, and uh, when I got out, I was a director. Cut. Cut. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Feature filmmaking is not for sissies. There are so many ways that you can fail as a filmmaker. I mean, technically, there can be some technical glitch, something you don't even know about until after you're finished and then you find out. There could be issues with actors uh, that, for whatever reason, auditioned really well, and then you get them on the set and 
they don't give you what you need. Film is a pretty daunting art form. You know, it's one of the most complicated art forms on the face of the earth. All of my films really, in one way or another, have some kind of autobiographical uh, touch to them. You were the officer who found our father, right? Yeah, we'd like to know exactly what happened. Once upon a time, there was a young fellow that was walking through the woods. He wondered if it ever come the time that he could find himself a dragon. Dad. Yes, Bobby. Hello. Hello. Dad. In a minute. Bobby, your father is having a conversation. Dad. All right, Bobby. What? Pop Pop doesn't have his glasses. Okay, sound. Rolling. Camera. Rolling. Take two. Action. I'm Roger Broadhurst. I live right over there. And I was wondering what's going on. Uh, yes, sir. Can I help you? Yes, I'm Roger Broadhurst. I live right over there, and I was wondering, what's going on? Well, sir, due to the recent event in Memphis... You mean the shooting of Dr. King? Yes, sir. That's exactly what I mean. With Tom, you just feel really comfortable on the set. He just has a way of making you feel at ease, and as a result, it's going to bring out the best performance with an actor, and there's just that, that trust between the actor and director. Roger, Millie needs to go home. There's got to be a way we can get her there. Oh. One of the things I really like about Tom's work is that he, he's very um, detail-oriented. He, he loves to make work that is grounded in some type of historical context. And um, he puts a lot of thought into um, how that historical framework affects you know, the production design. He's, been working a lot on um, issues of race in his work. The civil rights movement has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. My name is James Roger Brown. I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, August the 22nd, 1927. I went down to the Twin Cities, took my cameraman and some equipment. We did a series of interviews with Jim Brown, and out of those interviews came the material for Mr. Brown. And then, of course, once I had the interview material together, I realized that I wanted to do some reenactment stuff. And so I managed to sort of tie in what I would like to do most of the time, which is dramatic narrative. I managed to find a way to sort of tie in some dramatic narrative elements into this documentary portrait. We were really shocked when we found out that we won that competition. And she said, whenever you want to see my kids, uh, you see him at the playground like you always do. She said, but you don't come to my house. Really, Tom was the first person to do that, to really move beyond just the talking head and use a lot of these different elements with reenactments and different scene settings. Um, and that was one thing that really set his work apart because he did it, and beyond him doing it, he did it just so beautifully because he has such a, a, a soft touch to when he transitions between Mr. Brown speaking and telling his story and then he just drifts into here he is as a boy talking about uh, the birthday party that he went to or going to the dance. You can adjust your horizon line on this. When I came here in 2004 to teach at MSU, we had about 20 majors in the program. Today, we have at least 175, and we're approaching 200. The thing that we try to instill in our students, which we feel will make them more marketable, is versatility. I think filmmakers, especially younger filmmakers, tend to make the mistake of thinking that in order for them to be legitimate, they have to be telling these grandiose stories. It has to be some kind of space opera. It has to be some kind of, you know, espionage caper. I happen to think that the most interesting stories, and in many ways the most important stories, are the small ones, the simple stories that are based on everyday experiences. That's fine. Okay, great. We're going to do it again right away. I'm surprised when things turn out well. There is a magic to it. My personal feeling is that the better directors are the ones who understand the basics in terms of storytelling and also understand the unique relationship between themselves and their actors. Cut. Okay, I'm happy with that. All right. 
from the rolling hills of Minnesota Lake Country to the vast horizon of North Dakota fields, Fargo artist Dan Jones doesn't have to venture far to find inspiration. No matter what the medium, oil, watercolor, or charcoal, Dan evokes feelings of home through his amazing landscape and figurative works of art. I love these old barns because they're just, you know, half of them are almost falling down. It's the nice thing about being a painter in Fargo is you don't have to drive very far to get into, you know, 30 miles east and you're into some really interesting landscape. Then it's the patterns in the field and the, you know, created by the rolling hills or the way the light's playing off the lake. Dan originally did some of his own framing, but I've pretty much in the past probably six or seven years taken over doing all of his framing. Lots of people when they're in looking at the pieces kind of recognize where the picture was taken from or it reminds them of somewhere they grew up in North Dakota or lived or had been on vacation. And I think that that's part of the appeal is it kind of makes people feel like they're at home. Dan is the artist he is, I think, because he lives in this Red River Valley, that the landscape truly informs his work. Worked as a carpenter for years. Ended up going to uh, NDSU. I thought I'd get an architecture degree. I had to take a drawing class and really enjoyed it, you know, really, really got into it. And so I went to the University of Minnesota the second year. Most of the professors there were abstract expressionists out of New York. I was trying to uh, learn how to paint in a much more traditional manner. I looked backwards to teach myself, you know, looked at previous artists' work, got to the museums whenever I could to see them in person, and did copies of old masters. Most of the stuff that I did was figurative, and the landscape came much later. I think it's very rare to come across an artist who is self-taught the way Dan is, that mostly people come out of school, and maybe that's why his art doesn't look academic. When I get into making them, you know, I get a lot of uh, enjoyment out of them, no matter what type of medium I'm using. I'm always looking for a fun new way to paint the flatness. <laughs> he could be defined mainly as an oil painter, but um, he's added some watercolor, and uh, his charcoal and pastels are beautiful. Um, so he's definitely a drawer also, and. Uh, I think to paint well, you do have to know how to draw well. I don't know anyone else who draws as well and uses it for such big statements. April 7th, 2009, a day that will live in infamy. I think Dan's getting well after this aneurysm owes a lot to the terrific support he received from other artists. They really loved the man. His friends would go out to Bismarck where he was in a, a rehab center and they would go out and they would paint in the landscape. To have survived it and still have the ability to do my work is you know, I'm a pretty lucky guy. North Dakota Museum of Art and in particular the director Laurel Ruder have been hugely supportive of me over the years. I began to think that I should do a big charcoal drawing exhibition to push him back into making drawings because I think his drawings are spectacular. She just asked me if I'd be interested in doing a show. You know, yeah. <laughs> grew up here and grew up hanging around the lakes in the summertime. To have a chance to do some 
different, you know, some large scale and, and I'm doing some smaller ones, some medium ones, and hopefully a couple of uh, really large. I want his drawings to be huge. I think something about the size and, and the drama of a, of a, you know, charcoal is attractive to people. This one looks pretty close to the actual spot. A lot of times they don't, they change to the point where, you know, I've let go of, you know, the photo image or whatever and, you know, and, and, and I'm just working on it as a piece with its own personality and its own needs. The most successful work is always work that engages you, the viewer, so that you have to finish it. And the fact that the drawings are in charcoal means there's no color giving you any clues, but you don't need the color because you fill it in. And then it becomes more personal. It's a conversation between you and the artist. My paintings are much like my children. I want them to go off and be successful. So when they sell, I get very fond of them then. That's a true mark of success, you know, to, to make something that somebody enjoys enough to, to uh, take home. The Og Creek String Band performs pre-World War II Appalachian old-time music with a variety of instruments, including banjo, mandolin, fiddle, and penny whistle. This unique style is a mix of dance music and ballads from Ireland, England, and Scotland with a touch of African gospel music. A special treat is the authentic cloggin' or flat footin' performed by member Liz Miller. My name is John Peters and I'm one of the uh, founding members of the Og Creek String Band or a old time Appalachian string band. Usually when people think of uh, Appalachian music, they think of bluegrass music and bluegrass is a relatively a newer style of music. It didn't really start showing up until the late 1930s, early 1940s. Uh, the style of music we play uh, predates that time. Uh, a lot of the instrumental tunes were around for at least 300 years. And the, a lot of these tunes were used like in uh, square dances, Appalachian big circle dances, and contra dances. This music's really made for people to dance to. As you can see when Liz is dancing, uh, what she's doing is uh, some people call flat footing, some people call clogging. But we also do uh, old time square dances and contra dances throughout the region. And we really want people to get involved with the music uh, more than just sitting down and listening to it. Get along home. 
If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Bob Dambach. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>